so uh, this is a new and still very early stage project on copyright theory. We've been hearing about patents just now. We're going to, when I'm done, we're going to hear about patents again. This is the, the, the copyright portion of the program. Uh, and copyright theory and patent theory both say that they want to uh, promote innovation. But uh, patent theory has an easier time, comparatively, uh, figuring out what are the, uh, what, what stuff is it that we would look for to be able to measure whether we're actually achieving that goal, right? Our cars are safer, our, our drugs are more therapeutic, our batteries last longer, whatever it is. Um, when it comes to expressive goods, like a novel or a film or a song, it's harder. Copyright has no self-evident theory of which are better and which are worse. So version 1.0, of copyright scholarship just kind of it tended to, to say, well, let's just get more, more stuff, whatever it is, just more works what, of whatever kind. And it's only recently that there's been more of a qualitative shift, um, and people are paying more attention to what kind of works uh, does the copyright system encourage. And that's the sandbox that I'm playing in here. Uh, usually, when policymakers talk about the social cost um, of the copyright system, they are talking about the constraints that it imposes on everyone else besides the copyright owner. Uh, I am bracketing that issue entirely here. Uh, I am focusing on a different kind of social cost, and that is a cost that is driven by how copyright protection, by how being the benef beneficiary of copyright protection can affect uh, your ex-ante investment decisions. And my argument is that marginal changes uh, in the level of copyright protection can be structured, even if unintentionally, uh, in a way that skews the direction of investment towards a universe of works that is more homogeneous than perhaps society might want. And this is largely a story about risk. Um, so, uh, given my surroundings here, I thought I would kick this off um, with a recent quote from Bollywood musician Benny Dayal, who, who said, uh, you know, I feel Bollywood music has got stereotyped and conventional in certain aspects. Uh, as audiences, we need to be more receptive to change and accept newer trends, which I'm hoping will happen over a period of time. Movies are just revamping old songs and playing it safe. More risks can change the scenario for the better. Now, I don't know whether anyone agrees with this assessment or not, speaking for myself, I am thoroughly agnostic. I don't particularly care whether this is accurate or not. What I do care about is that this sentiment that, uh, uh, that there is a desire for risk-taking in the arts um, is a sentiment that you will encounter all over the place. So uh, another example, uh, director Francis Ford Coppola recently said at the Marrakesh Film Festival, I don't know, uh, if, you can, if you can read that from where you are, but uh, uh, he said, you know, you try and go to a producer today and say you want to make a film that hasn't been made before, they will throw you out because they want the same film that works, that makes money, they don't want you to take chances. For me, this raises an important question, which is if we want to see artists taking risks in their work, what are the optimal conditions for supporting investment in creative risk taking. And I want to try and convince you that copyright law actually has a lot to do with the conditions that Coppola is describing here. Um, that argument uh, spans three points. First, copyright policy needs to take into account the reality that markets for cultural goods are intermediated, and so copyright protection should not be just about authors, but also the institutions that support authorship and make it possible. Number two, at least at a high level of generality, stronger copyright protection uh, can raise the upside of risks, uh, making a, a, a risky venture more financially palatable than it otherwise would be, uh, and maybe at the margin making it more likely that more groundbreaking works um, are going to get made. I think that's uh, this is a particularly relevant point in a discussion about emerging media marketplaces where you will sometimes see the argument that 
uh, these economies would be better off with stricter copyright protection because it would encourage creative upstarts to innovate rather than rely on what already exists. But that brings me to my third point, which is that it ain't so simple. Uh, in fact, I think increasing protection, if it's done in the wrong way, can have just the opposite effect. It can discourage investment uh, in risky projects, and it can do so because copyright protection's private value to the owner uh, can be unevenly distributed across the range of activities that a copyright protects. And we should expect investment to skew towards the rights which have the highest value in the marketplace. And that skew uh, can make the resulting works more homogeneous. And I'm using the example here of the US film industry, uh, which is extremely capital intensive and is often uh, in the United States put forward as the poster child for why we need uh, strong copyright protections. Uh, in Hollywood, uh, the overall value of copyright protection is skewing more and more towards the adaptation right. Um, and that, I am arguing, is driving studios away from differentiated products and more towards similar low-risk uh, uh, blockbuster franchises that are best equipped to exploit that right. Um, okay, let, let me take a step back and, and, and uh, uh, deal with some bedrock here. So when a lot of people think about copyright, they think about authors, um, right? Some lone creative individuals working away on some song or novel or, I don't know, maybe some software code. Uh, but copyright does a lot more than just help those individuals. Even in 2016, with uh, all of the lower barriers to entry that digital technology and the internet uh, have facilitated, there is still an important role to play for intermediaries like record labels and movie studios. Um, they are able to pool risk um, and thereby bring capital intensive works to market that would probably never be made to begin with if we were living in a totally disintermediated world. The reason for that is that markets for cultural goods uh, almost always are lottery-like. You have a few massive winners and then a whole bunch of losers. Uh, among US films, for example, last year, over 25% of total box office revenue came from five films. Um, and so by amassing large and diversified portfolios of works, intermediaries can take on risk that a rational actor would never take on if it were just dealing with a single capital-intensive work in isolation. Those firms know that markets for cultural goods are pretty unpredictable. You are essentially guaranteed to have some flops no matter what you do. And so you need to ensure that you can appropriate enough value from the hits to be able to survive uh, the cost of those flops if you're going to be successful. Now that seems to push in favor of some strong appropriability mechanism, whether it's copyright or something else. But if it's not copyright, you should have a good explanation for what it's going to be. Uh, also, the more competition that is out there uh, for people's leisure time, the more expensive it is to market your product, to cut through all the noise. Uh, uh, in the US, film production budgets can be over 50% of the total production costs. Uh, and so th that's a very steep cost, and you're going to need to have some, uh, 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 some way to be able to cover it if you're going to compete. Again, seems to push in favor of uh, some strong appropriability mechanism, and that's one dominant narrative that you hear. If you want to see more creative risk-taking in the content industries, uh, jack up copyright protection. Raise the upside of your risky bets. Make uh, the expected value of those bets higher, and maybe you'll see them taken on more frequently. Uh, if you look at the, the, the uh, film industry today in the US, you know, risk taking is not a word that is usually used to describe it. You might have noticed the rise of sequels and franchises um, in recent years. This is uh, a, a projection from 2014 um, of all the comic book franchises coming down the pike. This actually is under-inclusive, we now know today, um, uh, but it still gives you a pretty, pretty good idea. Um, if you expand it to just franchises generally, it's a whole lot of uh, 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 sequels of of every shape and stripe, not just comic books. Uh, and as others have documented, this makes some economic sense right now because your average return on investment for sequels, the, your blue line here, uh, is higher than 
uh, what it is for non-sequels, the red line below it. Uh, but it hasn't always been this stark. So um, sequels are doing more work now than they, they have ever done. We are seeing franchises responsible for a rising percentage of box office revenue out of the top uh, 100 films. So it used to be that sequels accounted for around 10% of total box office revenue. Now we're up near 50. Um, so why, why is this happening? If you ask some analysts that cover the film industry, they'll just chalk this up to growing risk aversion. Um, this was a very widely circulated piece in, uh, the, the, uh, from a, a journalist that covers the film industry who said that, you know, this is the problem here is that, you know, these executives, they don't have a creative bone in their bodies. Uh, they've lost the joy in creative risk. It's just been replaced by a dread of losing. I don't know. Maybe this is part of it, but I think at best there is a lot more to the story here. I think you know, film has always been a business. These are sophisticated players that know how to take on risk when it is in their best interest. And I don't think you can explain this away by just some generational change in executives' risk preferences. Instead, I think part of it has to do with changes in how studios are capable of appropriating the value of their product. The private value. Uh, of the right to perform or the right to make reproductions, which are part of the copyright bundle, is not worth as much today as it used to be. Part of that is for reasons that are entirely innocuous. So TVs are getting bigger. Um, there's more uh, programming on television than there ever has been before. That means that any given film is facing more competition for viewers' leisure time than ever before. OK. Uh, some of it is not so innocuous. So uh, here I have to mention piracy. So even if there are alternative uh, uh, outlets for consumers to get content, Piracy is still going to lower the, the price that um, that content can command in the marketplace. And so I think there's a plausible case here that those risky bets aren't worth as much, and so we're seeing fewer of them. Instead, we are seeing firms playing it safe by producing more sequels. Um, these are safer uh, in part because past performance does give some signal of future performance, even if that signal is somewhat noisy. Um, so director uh, Vikram Bhatt basically said as much recently, um, for why uh, uh, studios in, uh, in, in, in Bollywood might uh, choose to, to use uh, pre-existing storylines. Uh, part of this is it goes back to marketing. It's just easier to uh, uh, market a product if there's a pre-existing brand recognition. So you might think, uh, based on everything I've said so far, that the culprit here is simply um, weak copyright. And this brings me to my last point, which is that I think things get tricky here, that the culprit isn't just the parts of copyright that have gotten weaker, it's also the part of copyright that has remained strong. So this is the adaptation right. Remember that copyright is a bundle of different rights. Um, and some of those rights, uh, uh, under certain circumstances, can be worth more in the marketplace than others. And if the exploitation of a higher value right correlates with a particular kind of work, we should expect to see a qualitative skew toward that kind of work. And guess what? That is what we're seeing out of Hollywood. Because while the value of other rights may have declined, the adaptation right has remained robust. US courts uh, are not hesitant to find violations of the derivative work right. And because exploitation of it tends to be um, uh, in a business to business context, there's a more meaningful threat of enforcement than there would be in more consumer facing rights um, where you know, if you don't like the price of something, you can go download something illegally. And realistically, you're not going to face a meaningful threat of getting sued for it. And so what's a profit maximizing studio to do? Make more films that can tap into those uh, higher value uh, revenue streams. And that means more films that can serve as platforms for adaptations, sequels, video games, merchandise, etc. Right now, um, and I'm going to wrap up with this, if the adaptation right were weaker, a couple of things might happen. We might get a lower level of investment overall, and then you know, maybe we'd have fewer special effects. Uh, but we also might get a more diverse slate of releases from year to year. Which is more valuable to society is a normative question I am not going to answer here. At least I'm not going to answer it in this paper. Uh, I, you know, my guess is it's going to vary from society to society. For my purposes, though, I would be content if we could just acknowledge that there is a trade-off between these two effects 
um, that may be happening uh, depending on how we structure our copyright policy. So, so to wrap up, when we think about um, how IP can help or hurt creative upstarts in uh, emerging media marketplaces, I think it's important to frame the policy question as more than just how much protection should we have, as if it's a single variable, but also to consider how that protection is going to be structured. Stop there. Thank you. Thank you.